Deep in the forests of Sumatra, a strange organism survives by sucking the life from its host. In this hot, dark, and damp environment filled with tigers, leopards, rhinos, and bears, the flora can be nearly as eerie as the fauna. When British colonists first encountered the plant in 1818, they could hardly believe what they were seeing and smelling. Dr. Joseph Arnold later wrote, Had I been alone and had there been no witnesses, I should, I think, have been fearful of mentioning the potent smell or extreme dimensions of this flower. So much does it exceed every flower I have ever seen or heard of. A swarm of flies hovered over its blood-red flesh, huge petals stinking of precisely the smell of tainted beef. What they had found was no ordinary flower. It was the Rafflesia plant, its flower measuring almost one meter across, with a putrid smell of rotten cheese, sweat, garlic, and decomposing meat. It's a plant with no stem, no roots, and no leaves. A plant that exists as a parasite to its unsuspecting host. The plants in the Rafflesia genus are some of the strangest in the world, and among the rarest. They grow in rainforests from Thailand and Malaysia to Indonesia and the Philippines, and are almost impossible to reproduce in laboratories. Despite their smell, Rafflesia are so iconic that they're one of the national flowers of Indonesia. They appear on stamps and currency in Malaysia. Their buds are considered a delicacy in Thailand, and the indigenous people of Borneo use them for medicinal purposes. While other smelly flowers, like the Titan Arum, draw huge crowds whenever they bloom in botanic gardens, Rafflesia flowers have rarely been seen outside of their jungle habitat. That makes them exceedingly mysterious, and perhaps stranger than other corpse flowers. Even though Rafflesia flowers haven't been turned into tourist attractions like the Titan Arum, they share some important traits with the other pungent plant. Both are enormous. Rafflesia being the largest flower known to humans, and Titan Arum being the largest inflorescence, which is a collection of many small flowers. And both smell absolutely terrible. But why on earth would something evolve to be this stinky? And why are the biggest flowers in the world also the stinkiest? The most obvious traits of Rafflesia are its enormous size and its potent smell. The smallest of the species have flowers the size of dinner plates, which is already quite large if you're used to seeing roses or daisies in your garden. And the largest so far was almost one meter in diameter, which is about the height of a seven-year-old child. But the more scientists have learned about the plant, the stranger it's become. Rafflesia plants are hollow parasites, meaning they can't survive at all without feeding off another plant. And their host of choice are viney liana plants, in the same family as grapes. The Rafflesia infiltrates its host with a single file line of cells that can stretch for more than 10 meters, sucking moisture and nutrients from the vine. Depending on the species, these threads will spread through the vine for up to 18 months before a bud ever appears. From there, it might be another nine months before the bud blooms into an enormous flower, and the flower only lasts four to five days before shriveling up. To try and understand more about the mysterious Rafflesia, over the past 10 years, scientists have been digging into its genome, and what they found has been as incredible as everything else about the plant. First, researchers discovered that Rafflesia abandoned its ability to photosynthesize millions of years ago. It has no chloroplast genome, which means it doesn't have any of the cells necessary for photosynthesis. Then, perhaps even more astonishing, is that Rafflesia has engaged in horizontal gene transfer. This is when genetic information is exchanged between organisms without reproduction. For a long time, this was thought to be possible only among bacteria and single-celled prokaryotes. An example is antibiotic-resistant bacteria. 
humans often feed cattle and other livestock antibiotics to prevent infections. The bacteria in those animals evolved to become resistant to those antibiotics, and in some cases, the bacterial changes have then transferred into strains of bacteria that infect humans, like Staphylococcus aureus. But in Rafflesia, horizontal gene transfer has happened between it and its hosts multiple times throughout its evolutionary history. It owes 2-3% to of its nuclear genome to the host plant, and as much as 50% of its mitochondrial genome to the host. And because there's genetic information from plants besides Tetrastigma, which is what Rafflesia uses as a host today, researchers think Rafflesia DNA might hold a record of its previous hosts. The host parasite arrangement dates all the way back to the mid-Cretaceous, about 100 million years ago. But with so many other genetic strategies, why did Rafflesia also become so smelly and so unpleasant? Before we get into the whys and hows of Rafflesia, consider what lies on the forest floor. Not just leaves and dirt, but all the things that are constantly in some process of decay. Dead wood and plant material, feces from all manner of animals, and decomposing animals from tiny birds to huge ungulates like deer. Over time, a diverse range of insects has evolved to live on this rotting material. And Rafflesia is capitalizing on these insects in a very unusual way. Many flowering plants rely on insects that search for sweet nectar and enticing smells. This is often a mutually beneficial relationship in which both plants and insects benefit from coming in contact. The plant gets pollinated and the insect gets nectar. But plants that evolved for carry-on mimicry are in a far more one-sided relationship. Insects that normally lay their eggs in feces or rotting meat come to the carry-on plants to do just that. They get covered in pollen while depositing their eggs. But when the eggs hatch, the larvae have nothing to eat. The flies do most of the work, and the plants get all the benefit. This is exactly how Rafflesia operates. It emits chemical compounds like dimethyl disulfide and dimethyl trisulfide. Those are both compounds produced by the bacterial breakdown of meat, which explains why the flower smells so terrible. But when scientists compared blowflies visiting rotten meat versus Rafflesia flowers in the wild, one species of fly made up 97% of all the visitors to the flower, while this same species accounted for only 25% of the flies visiting the rotten meat. The scientists found that Rafflesia was also producing other chemicals, like benzenoids. For that reason, the scientists hypothesized that Rafflesia uses more than just the smelliest smells to attract specific flies. It has its own unique chemical mix. But Rafflesia doesn't stop there. The spongy texture of the petals also mimics decaying flesh, and some species of the plant even generate heat, a trick called thermogenesis. It's rare in plants, but other stinky species do it as well, such as the skunk cabbage. For Rafflesia, the heat might help disperse its stink more widely. Luring in carry-on flies could also be why such smelly plants have evolved to be so huge. Their greater size might make them look more like dead animal carcasses, might help flies see them on the crowded forest floor, and could help to temporarily trap the insects. Because while carry-on plants like Rafflesia don't eat flies like carnivorous plants, they still need the flies to get up close and personal with them. Unlike many other flowers whose pollen is light and powdery, the male Rafflesia flowers have a viscous liquid pollen. Because of that, the carry-on fly who visits it needs to come in very close contact with the flower in order to be coated with the sticky, wet substance. Once the pollen dries, it can remain viable for several days to weeks as the fly darts around the forest. If it comes in contact with a female Rafflesia flower, the pollen is rehydrated by the moisture of the plant, and the female flower is pollinated. From there, it produces fruit that looks like a pat of manure and carries hundreds of thousands of tiny seeds, no larger than a grain of sawdust. 
How those seeds go on to become parasites in new vines is still a mystery. Do ants bury them near the roots of liana vines? Or maybe small mammals carry the seeds up to the vines? To this day, scientists have not figured it out. The only botanist who has ever successfully cultivated Rafflesia in a garden has never successfully germinated one from wild seeds. Instead, she grafts tissues from a Rafflesia-infected vine into another host plant. Over the years, she's raised 16 flowers from bud to bloom. But so far, the male and female flowers haven't bloomed at the same time, so pollination has never yet occurred. That means you're unlikely to see a Rafflesia flower anytime soon, unless you travel out to the jungle. Though if you're interested in other smelly plants, there are plenty of gardens that successfully raise Titan Arum flowers. There's still so much we don't know about Rafflesia. A recent chemical analysis of one species found that it might also have strong antibacterial properties for antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And it's even possible there are new species in the Rafflesia genus that have yet to be discovered. But unfortunately, Rafflesia don't grow in very abundant numbers, and that makes them especially vulnerable to forest fragmentation and habitat destruction. For now though, they'll keep growing in the dark and the damp, luring in curious humans and eager flies with their absolutely terrible stench. Sometimes when making these videos, I end up googling some questionable things. We've all been there wondering if your FBI agent is taking note of your internet activity. You can go incognito, but that isn't enough to keep your searches truly private. The only way to browse the internet without leaving a trace is to use a VPN, and the best one to use is NordVPN. NordVPN is based away from the EU and US jurisdictions and has no obligation to collect your personal information. They don't record, monitor, store, log, or share anything you do. They can't provide any details about your internet activity to anyone ever. Why? Because they don't have anything to provide. But it's not just about questionable Google searches. The internet is becoming an increasingly restricted place. Geoblocking in its mildest form stops you from watching certain Netflix shows. And at its worst, allows tyrannical governments to prevent people from using Google or access the news. Everyone deserves an open internet, and NordVPN is helping to make that a reality. With a simple click of a button, you can change what country you're browsing the internet from. You can access the libraries of streaming services in other countries, access blocked websites, and browse totally privately. It's a simple, streamlined, super effective service that I rely on all the time. So go to nordvpn.com slash real science to get NordVPN's cybersecurity package and four months free. It's risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. And if you're looking for something else to watch right now, you should watch our latest video about the insane biology of the seahorse, or watch Real Engineering's latest video about the insane engineering of the Spitfire.